Okay, thank you, Edu and uh, Mujib for joining today. So we're looking at chapter three. So chapter three is basically about reactivity in Shiny because Shiny is not like other programming languages that we are conversant with. Shiny run because of reactive programming, okay? So we are using reactive programming in Shiny. So this is an elegant and powerful programming paradigm, but it can be disorienting at first. So I don't want to read the book. We are all supposed to have read it. So I'm just going to take you through what I understand by the book as well. Like, okay, we've read it. So I'm going to be using the book as well as um, the data science learning communities um, book, like a summarized version of it. So I'm going to introduce you to that as well, to the group and it's, we have a lot of, so many communities around that we can all learn from. So um, we're going to combine that effort to make things a little bit easier for everyone. So this chapter provides a general, uh, kind of a gentle introduction to reactive program, like I said. So um, teaching you the basics of common reactive constructs that you will have to get familiar with in shiny apps. So we have the server function, which is this. We have, this is for the server side and also this is for the UI. What we see is what generates that for us. So I'm going to switch in between. So we'll be able to use that to help ourselves. So let me, first of all, before we go too far, let me take you to that the the community so that if you want to join you can also join that community sorry can you okay yeah i'm sharing it now so if you look at this there's a book club mastering shiny book club that is under the data science learning community here so this group is available they've done a lot of work helping to understand so many books about R that could help us. So you can join this Slack channel to gain more and also contribute to the community. So I also partake in that group as well. They have a YouTube channel where all the recordings for the sessions, for the study groups are the book clubs. So they call it book clubs. So you can get lost by exploring all these channels, the playlists, they are very wonderful and it's a good way to learn. Also, you will find our YouTube channel useful as well. We have the playlist for all the study group that we're having, so you can explore all these recordings when you have the time or you missed any of this. So let's cut short the book and I will take you through the summary that was used in the DS. LC book club. So the summary, the objective of the book, the chapter three is to explain in more detail how the input and the output arguments work. So we're differentiating between imperative and declarative programming. And we describe the basis of reactivity and apply reactive expressions to eliminate duplicated work. So, um, Okay, so to recap, R scripting, like we're familiar with, is like a sequential step-by-step, step, step one first, then step two. But reactive programming, no, it's, it's not sequential. It depends on the reactive graph before you can say that, okay, this is going to happen or this is not going to happen. So it's not sequential, it's different on its own. So it's important learning so far. So for the main app, so the front end is where we have the UI object. So it contains the HTML presented to every user of your app. So it's simple because every user gets the same HTML. 
pay HTML, the same HTML document irrespective of your session. So it on now depends on the interaction between the user and the UI that you're having that would determine the differences. So it's simple because every user gets the same HTML, okay, like we said before. So the backend has the server object. So it's more complicated because every user needs to get an independent version of the app. So when a user A modifies an input field, user B shouldn't see their output. So it does the basic thing there. So that is where the reactive programming comes in. So you don't have to see everything or affect any other user while you are interacting with the app. So the app is independent of who is on which component. So create a new environment for each run, giving each session to have a unique state. So the picture here depicts the scenario which every user will go through. So we have the shiny UI. So like you want to create your UI based on the Fluid page or any other page um, template that you want to use. So this will generate the HTML document that you will see in your browser. Then we have the server side, which determines what is actually going on with each user. It would be different, but you have the same UI. Okay. So you have the same UI here. So a deeper dive into the server function now, you have the inputs, okay? Input that you have within your server side. So it's a list-like object used for receiving input sent from the browser. So it's read-only, okay? So you can't reassign values to it, but you can assess any object through the input. Okay, so by using the dollar sign um, syntax or operator. So it must be read in a reactive context. You cannot assess the value outside of a reactive context. Example, uh, render text. If you do anything outside the render text, you're not going, you get to get an error. So a reactive um, function. So the now output is the same thing. It's list-like object is used for sending output, okay? That's the result of the interaction that is now kind of um, treated from the server side. So always use with a render function, sets up the reactive context and renders the HTML. So you would always get the output in relation to any render function in this uh, from the server side. So this is an example. You have the output here and it's been assigned a reactive function here. So now let's talk about reactive programming, which is an elegant and powerful programming paradigm and dot. It can be disorienting at first because it's very different paradigm to writing a script. Okay, that's the R script. So that's the definition Adley we can give to the programming reactive. Okay, so mental model tell versus inform, providing shiny with recipes, not giving it commands. So I'm going to take you back to the book and I will show you that aspect. Now, so um, let's see, where am I? Okay. So if I, if you can't see my book, so just let me know. I'm switching between the slides and or the summarized version of the book by the DSLC book club and as well as the book. So maybe I should, okay, I've introduced this. So let me just bring both of them together. Yeah, I think this will make it easier before going to our studio. So, um, okay, now we've, been, we've talked about the input output. Okay, now where are we? The imperative, yes. I have some areas here that I would like to talk about. So now, if you're looking at the imperative programming, so it's like what we are used to in our R script. So then that's what Adley will come is explaining there. So you issue 
a specific command and it carried out the simple output. It carried out the it carried this out immediately and you get the results immediately. Step by step. It's like adding a number or importing a data or transforming it or visualizing. It gives you the result out rightly. But declarative programming is a little bit higher. So it describes important constraints and rely on someone else to decide how and or when to translate um, that into action. So this is the style of programming you use in Shiny. So it's different from the static one by one step. You do this and I get the result. But here we're looking at describing or maybe kind of if your interaction with the app would decide what and what you get. So not about the command. So um, so with imperative code, you say, okay, make me a sandwich. While declarative code, you say, ensure there is sandwich in the freeze, refrigerator whenever I look inside of it. So what this means is that imperative code is assertive, declarative code is passive aggressive. That means we show you the, imp the declarative code will help you to understand how you can achieve it, but it's not a like a um, military command that okay, you do this, you you have to do that. No. So or make me a sandwich. Okay, no. You just make sure that I get it. You already know how to do it. Make the sandwich, you know where to keep it for me. Just make sure it's there. That's all. So it's not that that's basically the difference. So most of the time, declarative programming is tremendously freeing. You describe your overall goals and the software figures out how to achieve them without further intervention. So um, so that would be that to clear the hair on the imperative programming day. So, and the declarative programming. So, okay, we've talked about this. So let's go to the second, the laziness. So it allows app to be extremely lazy. Yeah, I already know what to do. Um, I don't have to be on, on like a soldier, uh, always on call every time. But I know when to or when I have to stand up or do something. So shiny aims. Shiny's aim is to only do the work that is needed. Okay, that is needed. That's where the laziness comes in. It will only update outputs that you are currently you can currently see. Okay, so it's asking will this app work? So we can copy this and go into R Studio this time around. Uh, oh, okay. We have new people joining. So okay, welcome Oge and Victor. Thank you for joining. Um, okay, let me go back. Back, go back uh, to my slide. All right, Let's right. see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to the R Studio. Hopefully, that is opened. Um, so I'm pushing in this. So, uh, okay, so this is what I copied. So let's see if we would get an error or this will run well. So let me just make it th03 underscore new. Okay. So provided we have this section here, we'll be able to run it as an app. So I'll click on this. Okay. That runs. Uh -huh. Now we get, okay, sorry. Let me make sure that you have, you can see the pop-up. Okay. It's saying this for the error could not find function str str underscore c so let's go into the code okay um where are you okay so e let's see so what we can say is that this was not declared the function here str underscore C 
wasn't declared. I think that's why we had the error there. So could not find function there. So it's logical that it's not here. So that's why the error is then the error statement is very clear. So could not find function this. So that is that. So let's go back to this slide. So um, what am I? Laziness. Okay, so this is this. So caution, if you're working on Shiny app and you just can't figure out why your code never gets run, double check that your UI and server functions are using the same identifiers. Okay, so let's check that again. So one thing, we couldn't find the function first, then now we're getting the information that we should check this. So um, let's see. Impute, impute, yeah. Text out. Okay, even the, where the information is going to be displayed as well is not covered. Uh, okay, now, okay. What we're going to look at is that, do we have the same thing here? And there's an error here. This is another error. So you can see that here. This is nice underscore day and this is nick underscore day this is greeting that is not an error but it's not just one also this is not covered from uh, the function as well so the identifiers also we have an issue there so go to the next slide so i'll go to the book as well so the reactive graph, so the reactive programming actually relies on this graph. So if you read through the book, you will get more information here. I think reading the book will be better because I can explain this, but you'll get more information from the book as well. So you can understand the execution. So, but basically what is happening in Shiny is dictated by this reactive graph, okay? So to understand the order of execution, you need to instead look at the reactive graph, which describes how input and output are connected. So the, react the reactive graph for the app above is very simple here, which we can see the server side. So that is depicted here. So we have the code here and we have the graph. So what it's saying is that we have the input, which is the name, this aspect here. Okay, I should just um, do some annotation here. So if you look at this, this is the input ID, okay, that we are referencing here. So there can be so many inputs, but their unique identifier would differentiate them and we assess them because it's less like using the dollar sign. So this is what we're looking at, okay? So, and this is the same thing that we have for the reactive um, graph. Now we have the input, okay? That is being fed into greetings, which should be the output that we're going to see in the browser, in the HTML file that is going to be rendered, okay? So this now is going to take the input just from the function that you can see, the paste function, you can depict that, okay, we are going to combine anything we get plus hello with space plus that input, then the exclamation mark. So that is what you're going to see in the browser. But how this is running, you will not get to see that, but it's happening behind the scene through the reactive graph. So we get the input, we give you the results. But that is when we need to do it again. Although the first thing is that when you run the app, we, you definitely get the default um, output. But the interaction now will do, we will affect and um, will determine how the UI changes in the browser. So the reactive graph contains one symbol for every input and output. And we also, of, okay, so 
the graph tells you that Britain will need to be recomputed whenever name is changed. So that is what I'm trying to explain. The interaction with from the user on the browser will determine what happens in the server again, because the laziness is always there. We will not our shiny will not do anything, or the reactive program will not work. Will make any changes except it needed to do that. Okay, so if there's change in the input that we're getting through the name input, then what is available in the greetings will change. So that's where the dependencies come. But if it's not available, it's not changed, won't get anything. So we'll often describe this relationship as greeting has a reactive dependency on name. That's the input. So not the graphical convention we used for this. This, 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 and this is what is there. So input goes into the what is going outside. Um, yeah, so we need to really understand this. Then reactive expression. So there's one more important component. Let me see if, um, okay. So we've gone through this. So reactive expressions now. So I want to make, use of the time so that would take, don't take too long. So reactive expression, so it's the what, that's a tool that reduces duplication in your reactive code by introducing additional nodes into the reactive graph. So how, how does that happen? So to reduce the duplication, we we'll use this function reactive. So it will only get a change only when this is changed or maybe there's a there's a reason why this has to change okay so and the the only reason that will come in is when this input is changed by the user from the ui side of the app okay so this is where everything now goes in so the dependency the reactive dependency for this string is the name. While for greeting now, you know, from the last slide that we had, we'll say, okay, okay, the book says that. Uh, where is it? Reactive dependence. Yeah. So, well, okay, so this is this. So, the reactive, the relationship is that greeting has a reactive dependency on name. But in this case now, for the reactive expression greetings as reactive dependency on string while string as that on the name. So that is the way the graph is being depicted yeah, kind of shown here now. So in other words, reactive makes apps cleaner and more efficient, by removing redundant codes and recomputation. So except name changes, we don't have to recompute what is being displayed on, on the UI side. That's through the greetings output. So reactive expressions have a flavor of both inputs and outputs. So like inputs can use the result of a reactive expression in an output. So like outputs, reactive expressions depend on inputs and automatically know when they need update. Okay. So just keep that at the back of your mind that that laziness is still there. It's always working there. So new vocal producers and consumers. Okay. Producers refer to reactive input and expressions. That is where we get what is going out. So consumers refer to reactive expressions and output. So reactive expressions comes in as a consumer again because they are taking in the input, whatever is coming from the input as well. So then the output is also there to take it also. So the picture actually summarizes everything. So review the example app testing, the difference between the two simulated samples. Let's go to the book. Okay, reactive expressions, we've gone that. Then order, execution order, is what we've explained that's based on the execution order depends on the reactive dependencies as well. 
so that is that so we have the exercises here that we can try so you can try all this out to master and understand better the reactive expression and dependencies expressions as well so reactive expressions now um we've quickly skimmed over reactive expressions a couple of times so you are hopefully getting a sense of it here okay the consumers now too we don't need to go over this i've done that with the slides slide from the dslc slides or, or summary they've given us so far so execution order now so the execution order determined solely by the reactive graph we explained that as well and not the order of lines of code or layout in the server function on like normal r scripts so for what I was trying to say is that even though this can come after the output here that we're rendering, it still doesn't affect it because the reactive graph would always um, be the kind of the machine that is going to be the one to determine what comes in first. Uh, the raw material would not come in after the main product or the output, the final output, no. Even though you put it there, the reactive graph would determine how the order is going to be. Okay, so you don't have to, like the normal script, you don't have a variable created already and is known, is known or within your environment, you cannot use it. You cannot use that um, variable. But in the case of Shiny, even though you've not had that in your environment, you're not going to get the output until it goes through and make sure that it has this because it's a dependency for you to get this one. So it's not about the order of the code that you're using, okay, or that you read, you've written in your code. So mess it up as you want, the reactive graph will always take charge. So, um, I hope I'm not fast, and if you have questions, kindly slow me down. And but I'm believing that we should collaborate and talk about the chapter we're supposed to read together. Not is not a tutorial class. It's a kind of it should be a two way thing. So if anybody has any addition questions contribution you can go ahead victor mujib oge babatunde please any contribution addition that's it's that's good that's to that's have you here babatunde it's that's been that's a long time nothing for me for now okay thank you victor <laughs> thank you but uh, i want to know that this uh, this, uh, this book we are at target formats Sorry, I didn't hear you well. Uh, this session is like an uh, interactive. Can one you know, interrupt you as well? Do you have to come to ask for questions? Sorry, it's, it's breaking. I don't know if it's from my side or yours, but I. Yes, it, 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 my side. Can you hear me now? I better now. Yes, yes. Now I'm saying, is uh, are we allowed to interrupt you while you speak, or do we have to wait until you ask for questions? Um. Actually, there are some tools within Zoom that could help us. Maybe I could chip that in. You can always use this um, interaction. I think there is. Sorry. Um, there should be something here. I know it's somewhere. <laughs> okay. That you can raise your hand or something. Oh, it's very good. It's not very soon. So, so you can just okay. Sorry, I this new interface. I not so familiar. Okay, let me stop sharing. I think yeah, it's there. So you can react like now. You can react. Okay. So if I click on this, I don't know what you see. Okay. So it's possible. I can see your logo. That's what I can see. You can see it. Your logo. 
Um, no, there should be something else. So I'm coming. Let me. Uh, okay. So for future reference, the book, the book's link has been shared in the chat. So what we do is that you read, then you come to the session next month. That next month now is going to be chapter four. So what we do is that we'll now collaborate. Somebody will take the lead. If you're comfortable with taking the lead, you can just inform me. Um, we have our chat uh, WhatsApp group as well, which you can join if you want to. I can share the link with you. So that group, you can signify or communicate with me directly that, okay, I want to take the next session. Okay, I'm ready. I've read the book. I've watched the past uh, videos and all this stuff. So then I would just change every information on our meetup page and you'll see your picture there. you see your name there, that you're the next person taking up the next session next month. So that is how we collaborate. And when we come in, if I'm taking the lead, you can contribute. You can just raise your hands and give part to it, support us. So it's not going to be choky for one person. So, um, Victor, you want to? Yes, I want to say something. Um, yeah, go know, ahead. I, I, Thank I, you. I, I was calm, you know, so I hope I'm not. Sorry. But, um, I said I was coming in and out, so I, I hope I'm, I'm not repeating something that you've already said. So. Okay, you, you, were, you were not? Okay. So what you're saying is that you want me to repeat what I said or something? No, I want to say something, but I'm hoping that I, I don't repeat what you said because I was uh, kind of, uh, I wasn't. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Wasn't, go ahead, go uh, ahead. Go ahead and so, give us a contribution. Okay, what I wanted to say is that um, regarding the reactive graph, I think um, one fundamental understanding that although you know, general, overall, the activity shiny is, um, is, is, is a lazy kind of evaluation, right? Only, only um, um, parts of the of the graph are used when an input changes. And also, the, the, the parts of the graph which are actually eager, the, the outputs are are eager. The outputs and uh, and the observers, they are, they are eager. That's why when, um, uh, I think that has to do with um, the, uh, when, when, um, uh, when the, the, the graph itself is the first um, formed or created by the eager evaluation of the outputs and the observers, that that's how the, the, the dependencies of the outputs and the others are determined to form the graph itself. Uh, Victor, we can't hear you again. No, I said, no, I think I, I'm, I'm done speaking on that. I was just trying to add that uh, oh. even though okay. even though it's a lazy evaluation, there are parts of the graph which are actually mm -hmm. eager in the evaluation, which are the outputs and the observers. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. So you can raise down your hands now by clicking the button again. <laughs> okay, do you know how to do that? Yeah, no, um, I'm doing it. Okay, <laughs> don't worry, we'll all get used to it. Okay, let me let me share back. Thank you so much for that um, contribution. So let me see where I am now. Would that be? I think so. Um, no, not this one. Okay. Um, I'm coming. Okay. Now, uh, where is my Zoom? Okay, I'm coming. I want to share the right slide. Okay, so 
Thank you for the contribution. So I'll move on. We've gotten the contribution on the differences between the producers and the consumers they gain from Victor and also about the reactive graph. So then we, if you read through the book, you'll get the motivation. So imagine I want to compare two simulated data sets with a plot. And this. so if you go through this, you might be able to get some kind of insight into what is actually happening. So to make this a little bit faster, controlling timing of evaluation now, let me see, 3.9. Okay, that is based on the running the slide here. So um that's an, an example, but we can look at the um, the graph, the reactive graph. So basically X as X1 from the code here, this reactive expression of value now has a kind of reactive dependencies on two values, lambda one and n, okay? Those are the two inputs now. Depends on these two. Okay. So now, this, like, these two, let's go to the book so that we won't, they, I don't think they are, timer is here, no. Okay, it's not, that example is not here. So, but, um, from what we can see here, these are dependence, reactive dependencies for X1. So, which is also serving as the producers from what we've learned. Okay, so they are given to this. The is, X1 is consuming that. So, although it's a reactive expression from what we have from the code, the same thing with X2. So, X2 also has dependencies here. One, two, three. Okay, that's three for X2. So, we have the timer here as well then these two values and uh, two inputs yeah, so we wanted to use values here so that is going into x2 again then the timer as well is also going to one so that are uh, good so the timer and also the two inputs those are the three producers and x1 and x2 are consuming the three inputs that they're getting okay Two inputs and the timer. Two inputs and timer. So one, two, one, two, uh, one. Okay, then another one, then two here again. Then we have the three, the third one. Okay, so that is that. Then the consumer, the overall consumer of everything that is coming from X1 and X2 is his, the Eastern plot. Okay, Baba, today you want to add something here. Uh, I can't hear you. I don't know if others can. Hello? Oh, okay. Um, okay, wait. I'm coming. Okay, please, can everybody mute? except me okay i'll mute all okay so baba today would you want to try and unmute yourself then you talk or, or was that what you wanted me to know okay thank you no problem then no problem. I think he maybe got caught up in something. He would have muted himself as well. So thank you so much for that observation. Okay, so so these are basically what we're looking at when we're talking about the reactive graph, the dependencies, and so on and so forth. So on click, so how using the action button and if, um event reactive is that okay? So you are excluded to save space, but it contains the action button as the one of the inputs here. So um, I think 
having the sorry any other question Okay. So let me let me take a look at the code. So for this slide, so I'll go back to the book. Um, you can try out the example that we have here. So the reactive graph has been explained so much. So and based on the code that we have here, the explanation also goes on in the book. And you can see the reactive graph. So the T test and the HIST, they have kind of related uh, inputs. So if you look carefully, you'll be able to figure out which ones are coming from where. Then also looking at the code, we'll be able to pull those ones out. So simplifying the graph, you can also go ahead and look at that and look at ways you can simplify it before coming back here to look at the code for simplicity. So then you'll be able to pull out some things here. So, so why do we need reactive expressions? When you first start working with reactive code, you might wonder why we need reactive expressions. Why can't you use your existing tools for reducing duplication in code, creating video, and so on and so forth? Unfortunately, neither of these techniques work in reactive environments, okay? So creating new variables and writing functions wouldn't go normal with our reactive programming here or reactive environment. So if you try to use a variable to reduce duplication, you might write something like this. Okay? So this, this, and we're assigning something here. Raise this, okay? So if you run this code, you get an error because you're attempting to assess Input values outside a what? A reactive context. So where where is the function? Okay, this is the where was there any function here? X1, X2. Oh yeah. So this is like a new variable that was created. Okay. And now you are trying to assess this reactive values from outside. That's what it's trying to tell you here. You get an error because you are attempting to assess input values outside the reactive context. And from what we discussed earlier, you cannot assess those values outside of a reactive uh, context. This would have been easier if you have R norm replaced with reactive function, okay? So if that is replaced, then you'll be able to do that. But here, you'll get an error. So if you try to use a function, the app will work. Okay, so you're creating a new function here. But it has the same problem as the original code. An input, which you are trying to get the value outside of a reactive context. Okay, it's the same thing. So reactive expressions automatically catch it there. Okay. Their results and only update when their input changes. So just be aware of that. That's a very key and very important thing you have to keep at the back of your mind when you are writing your code in a reactive um, context like Shiny App, where you should understand that you are using reactive programming. Okay. So while variables calculate the value only once, the porridge is too cold, the functions calculate the value every time they're called. The porridge is too hot, okay? Reactive expressions calculate the value only when it might have changed, okay? Only when it might have changed, and that's the power of reactive programming. So the porridge is just right, okay? So when it is needed, it will change. That's also bringing in the fact that the laziness aspect of reactive programming. So controlling timing of evaluation, this is this code. We can look at that. That is one of the um, reactive graphs that we have in the slide. So timing, validation, and all this stuff. So just try to look at this example. Then you'll be able to do more with that. I'm looking at the time. So in the above scenario, 
So on the click, that's using the button now to interact or to make changes to the app. Okay. So think about what will happen if simulation code took one second to run. We perform the simulation every 0 0.5 seconds. So Shiny sure would have more and more to do and would never be able to catch up. So the pr same problem can happen if someone is happily clicking buttons in your app and the computation you are doing is relatively expensive, especially on your hardware or your system. So it's possible to create a big backlog of work for Shiny. And while it's working on the backlog, it can't respond to any new event. So this leads to a poor user experience. And now your users will be complaining it's too slow, is hanging and all this stuff. So if this situation arises in your app, you might want to require the user to opt in to perform the expensive calculations by requiring them to click a button. Okay, so to stop this, a, a user might just be clicking. What we're just trying to bring out from this is that I can be so funny as a user and start clicking and clicking and clicking. Okay, but you can control this in your app by doing what? Requiring them to click a button. So this is a great use case for an action button. So um, the UI, this is the UI, and we have the last part as the action button. But let's look at the server side. That's where you get to see where we will require them to use it. So to use the action button, we need to learn a new tool. To see why, let's first tackle the problem using the same approach as above. As above, we refer to the simulates without using its value to take a reactive dependency. So if you look carefully at the server-side code, the reactive expression here, excuse me, takes in the input simulate. Then this function, r poise, takes in the input n and the lambda 1. So the same thing for this x2. Then we'll render the plots, taking the reactive expression output for both for to create our plot. Okay. So now this is the graph. As we see it here, the graph doesn't accomplish our goal. We've added a dependency instead of replacing the existing dependencies. Okay. So this yield the app in this, this, this. So, but let's go, let's go ahead. To solve this problem, we need a new tool, a way to use input values without taking a reactive dependency on them. So we need event reactive. Okay, now here, the event reactive, which has two arguments. The first argument specifies what to take as a, take a dependency on. And the second argument specify what to compute. That allows this app to only compute this x1 and x2 reactive expression when simulate is clicked. Okay, that's the action button. So what we're doing is that we're using this function to require only if that button is clicked. So that's when we we'll react or respond to the interaction. So if you look at the code here, instead of just being a reactive expression that anytime you click it, we'll, or we are just trying to make this responsive or something, we are only reacting when the input simulate is clicked. So we watch out for whenever the simulate button or the action button is clicked. That is when we'll make some kind of response to looking at, is there anything that changed? If none of this is changed, we won't do anything because of the laziness our, our approach here. But if any of this is changed, then we'll do something. But if we notice that you click the button, this would be triggered somehow. It will wake up. That okay, don't be on standby or something. I think somebody needs something then to now check did any of this change? If nothing changed, okay, we'll go back to relaxing. Okay, the same thing goes for X2. So that 
is now going to be when this last one, the plot will be changed. Okay? So by none of their dependencies, like lambda one n changes, that's the input that is coming into, um, as well as the simulator that is coming into x1 and x2, then we don't need to make any real changes to the last um, consumer here, is to, that's the histogram. So that's uh, basically what is going on. And that's where we have the advantage of having this one. We will listen, we're watching out for you to click the simulate button, but only if some changes. So two steps, we're watching out. It's not that every time you click, oh, something will happen, but we're watching out for that now. Then we would run this if any of these dependencies changed. So that's my own understanding there. So observers now, so far we focused on what this, this, this. So, so the action here, let me just read this, but sometimes you need to reach outside of the app and cause side effects to happen elsewhere in the world. So this might be saving a file or this sending data, updating this, printing and this. So these actions don't, don't affect how your app looks. So you shouldn't use an output and a render function. Instead, you need to use an observer. And the uh, examples of uh, observers are this event, react event, this. So there are multiple ways to create an observer and we'll come back to them later in section 15.3. For now, I wanted to show this to you, how to use observer if event because it gives an important debugging tool when you're first learning Shiny. So observer event is very similar to events reactive. It has two important arguments like this. So the first argument, you can see they are similar, but they are working differently. So I can see your hands, but let me just finish this side. I can see your hands raised, Victor. So the first argument is the input or expression to take a dependency on. The second argument is, for example, the following modification to the server side. So from what we had um, earlier or so, so what we're looking at here is this. We have two inputs. Then we have a reactive expression. This, which is dependent on this input. So, and we need to have it rendered out. So but what we need to do is that we have an observer, this, um, that is down here. So it's going to watch out for any changes in this one, okay? And now pass out this message, greetings performed, okay? So if you read through this one, the first, okay, this, for example, this one. So the explanation here is this. There are two important differences between observe event and event reactive. You don't assign the result of observe events to a variable. So you can't refer to it from other reactive consumers. So it's just like observing, not sticking anything in. Okay. So let me stop here. I want to listen to Victor. Hello, Victor. Yeah. That's Victor. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Um, yes, Victor, can you hear you? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I think um, the way I, uh, I understand observers, one easy way of remembering or distinguishing them from other parts of the graph, that the observers um, usually only have side effects, they do not produce any outputs, as well as the outputs. I mean, the outputs, sorry, the outputs and the observers do not, do not produce any outputs. By output, I mean, they do not return a value that can be captured by name uh, or, or can be bound bound to a name like you have uh, reactives that gives you 
uh, that you can bind to your name and, and you can now use it all over your 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 app. So um, observers and outputs they give side effects. The output the side effect of outputs is is whatever is uploaded onto your onto your app. And the observers do other side effects like maybe or maybe um, save the save data or open the file or whatever it is. That's what I want to contribute. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think that added more to the explanation I have. And that's the beauty of sharing knowledge. You can't be a know it or even I can be blabbing or getting out of school. So we need ourselves to support us each other. So thank you so much for that contribution. So do you have any other addition or omission that we want to add? Oh. Baba Sunday, do you want to add anything? Mujib? Oh, okay. Okay. You, I know you're just coming in. So, um, um, can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to add like a bit of context as to cases or situation whereby you might want to use or observe event or event reactive. So I'm imagining you have like a big dashboard. And let's say you are um you host your database on on um one of these cloud service providers so that each time you query um something it costs some money or you are pinging an API and when you ping the API to get some data to fetch some data you have to pay some money so so the popular one is let's say you integrate ChatGPT um OpenAI API into your app. And you already build the interface using Shiny, which is very possible as well. And each time a user is changing, uh, say, input uh, button, dragging, um, dragging slicer or slider and like and like setup, it's already like sending a request to your API. So that will cost you a lot of money. And in that case, you might want to use this, uh, for instance, the onclick um, on uh, event so that the request will only be sent when the user is sure of all the input he or she wants to do. Then with that, you might reduce your cost. So in, in some cases, the reason why you will go with event uh, reactive is probably you want to reduce cost or you don't want to overload your database and so on. So that's just the context I just want to add. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Robert Sunday, for that contribution. So I think we have some addition to the explanation we have here on when and the advantages of using observe events or observers compared to just using the reactive um, expressions and so on. So um, let's see. So, and remember the differences, we have like two similar observers here. While observe event is kind of doing a similar thing to what event reactive is doing, we cannot assign whatever is happening within this observer to a variable. We cannot. So you can't refer to it from other reactive consumers as well but you can do that with event reactive. So observers and outputs are closely related. You can think of outputs as having a special side effect, okay? Updating, that's the, the example of the side effect is that you are updating the HTML, the user's browser, okay? So to emphasize this closeness, we'll draw them the same way in the reactive graph. So, um, so you can see the two things here. If we go back to the code, you will see that, okay, the observers that we're looking at, observers and outputs. Um, okay, Victor, you have something to say. Yes, I want to just say, clarify a bit that, uh... With uh, you know, you can update your app not just with um, uh, the outputs, 
that is that is the render function. You can also you can also update it with, within an observer. But just just like we're we're saying that observers allow you to allow you to uh, or they have or they have, they have side effects. So the in in an, in an observe function or observe context, you can use uh, an update function to update your app. Maybe change uh, the, the HTML of of the app depending on the, on the, on the that type of function you're using. Not necessarily rendering an output. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, I believe uh, we're adding more value to the session now that the interaction makes sense so much and is helpful for those who are also participating here. So you can get from what Victor has just said is not um, necessarily that we have something to show on the HTML side when things are being updated, but things can be updated behind the scene, but you wouldn't be seeing them on the HTML. I hope that's the same thing that you're saying, Victor. No, 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 you may still see it. Uh, uh, let's say, for example, now, you know, we have this update function in China. So if you have, let's say, you have um, a select, select input that has certain options, and then based on whatever you're doing, those options might, might, might need to change. So you use an observer, you know, uh, run an update function inside the observer. So once you have you know, a certain condition fulfilled, now you, you now change the... So if, if I'm a, an, an input that says, okay, select A, B, C, D, and now you want to add E to it, you can now add E to the, to the existing options, depending on what you know, you're, you're, you're trying to do. Thank you so much there. Okay, I think we've heard so much about observers and outputs now, as well as updating your app. And um, this video is being recorded. You can also watch it again, as well as check out the Data Science Learning Communities YouTube channel as well to corroborate your knowledge and get more exposure to different um, professionals who are already using it and also reading the book. So you can learn so much from both communities, the Abuja R user group and the data science learning community. So some really, this chapter should have improved your understanding of the back end of Shiny apps. That's the server code that responds to user in actions, user actions. So you've also taken the first step in mastering the reactive programming paradigm mm, that underpins Shiny. What you've learned here will carry you a long way. We'll come back to the underlying theory in chapter 13. That is why reactivity. So reactivity is extremely powerful, but it is also very different to the imperative style of our programming that you've, you're most used to. Don't be surprised if it takes a while for all the consequences to sink in. Yeah, definitely. So this chapter concludes our overview of the foundation of Shiny. So the next chapter will help you to practice the material you've seen so far by creating a bigger Shiny app designed to support a data analysis. So to add to the summary that uh, Hadley Wickham has given in the, in the book for this chapter, take your time to understand reactivity because that is where you will not necessarily get it wrong with Shiny. Understand it very well. Check out that chapter 13 and 14. We'll get there soon. But it's, it's very key to getting Shiny app working properly so that you don't get your users to abandon the app that, okay, it's getting too slow or getting errors. It's saying, it's just looking at us like, okay, the app is not even responding. So you need to get used to this chapter, read it over and over again, and master what we mean by reactivity, reactivity graph, reactive expressions, um, reactive dependencies. All these are terms, just use them like you're using your local language. 
if you want to be a shiny developer. So I think this is where we're going to say thank you. Okay. Okay. We're not going to say that now. Okay. Victor. You are raising your hands. Sorry, pardon me, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm driving. That, that, that's why I'm, I'm here. Okay. No problem. You want to add something before we... Or... No, just just to thank you for... for the wonderful... Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So this is where we'll stop for today. And we hope you'll read up before joining up for the next session next month. And we still have other study groups coming up tomorrow, Friday, I think, Wednesday. So, but check out our meetup page. That would be meetup. So this is our meetup page. I'll share the link here so you can follow up with us, join the group, and you'll be always notified of any events that we'll have or study, study groups that are already booked or created already for you to just follow up at your calendar. So um, I think this is where we'll say a big thank you to everybody. Thank you so much. This has been a lively session for the interaction. Baba Tunde, Mujib, Oge, Victor, thank you so much. And we look forward to meeting you next month. Yeah, no, tomorrow, tomorrow, this week, we have a lot working on. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.